Hi, everyone. Welcome back to our symposium, The Marshall Plan for Moms. What would it mean for America to put care first? For those just joining, I'm Madeline Jory, Interim Executive Director of the Birnbaum Women's Leadership Network. Our next panel, Looking Forward, Reimagining an Equitable Care Infrastructure, will be moderated by Professor Latoya Baldwin-Clark. Professor Latoya Baldwin-Clark is an Assistant Professor of Law at UCLA Law School. Previously, she was an Earl B. Dickerson Fellow and Lecturer in Law at University of Chicago Law School. She writes and teaches about education law, family law, property law, and race and discrimination. Professor Baldwin Clark received her BS in Economics cum laude from the Wharton School, the University of Pennsylvania, and her MA from the University of Pennsylvania in Criminology. She then earned her PhD from Stanford University in Sociology and her JD from Stanford Law School. While at Stanford, Baldwin Clark was a Diversifying Academia Recruiting Excellence Fellow and held a Stanford Graduate Fellowship. After law school, she clerked for the Honorable Claudia Wilkin of the Northern District of California, as well as the Honorable Goodwin Liu of the California Supreme Court. Baldwin Clark's publications have appeared or will appear in the Virginia Law Review, Harvard Civil Rights Civil Liberties Law Review, Sociological Inquiry, The Modern American, and Encyclopedia of Diversity in Education, among others. Welcome, LaToya, and I'm handing it over to you. Hi, thank you so much, Madeline. Uh, so I want to jump right into our panelists so we have as much time as possible uh, to talk. So this panel will look forward to setting an agenda for implementing and, int and integrating a Marshall Plan for Moms into future policy efforts. So before we start, let me introduce our panelists. I'm gonna start with Tim Allen. So Tim Allen is the CEO of Care.com, responsible for the company's strategic direction, leadership, and growth as well as his commitment to deliver on its mission to transform and improve how families around the world connect with and manage care for their loved ones. Mr. Allen is a 15 year veteran of media and technology company IAC and has played pivotal roles in shaping the early days of well-known brands like Vimeo and Ask.com and has held leadership operations and management positions at dozens of other IAC portfolio companies in categories such as search, mobile software, and video. Most recently, as founder and CEO of IAC's Mosaic Group, Mr. Allen led the acquisition of more than a dozen mobile software developers globally. He earned his MBA from Northeastern University, a BS in information technology from the University of Massachusetts, and completed the general management program at Harvard Business School. Welcome, Mr. Allen. Next, we have Rianne Horgan, who is the founder and CEO of Silver, an award-winning app dedicated to helping people over the age of 50 retire with confidence. Silver has assisted more than 120,000 Americans as they navigate the retirement process. Silver's proprietary retirement score predicts how long your savings will last in retirement. And our retirement school is designed to help you on all the topics you need to master as you embark on your retirement journey. Prior to becoming CEO of Silver, Ms. Horgan was a managing director of JP Morgan Chase. She is a best-selling author and has been a vocal advocate for ensuring that social security is modernized to meet the reality of 21st century retirement. Welcome, Ms. Horgan. Next, we have House Representative Grace Meng. Representative Meng represents the sixth con congressional district of New York, encompassing the New York borough of Queens, including West, Central, and Northeast Queens. And she introduced the Marshall Plan for Moms in the House of Representatives. Representative Meng is the first Asian American member of Congress from New York State and the only Congress member of Asian descent in the entire Northeast. Representative Meng is a member of the House Appropriations Committee and its subcommittees on state and foreign operations and commerce, justice, science, and related agencies. Previously, Representative Meng served on the House Foreign Affairs Committee and the House Small Business Committee. Representative Meng is also a senior whip and regional whip for New York and a founder and co-chair of the Kids Safety Caucus, 
the first bipartisan coalition in the House that promotes child safety issues. Prior to serving in Congress, Representative Meng was a member of the New York State Assembly, and before entering public service, she worked as a public interest lawyer. Representative Meng graduated from the University of Michigan and earned a law degree from Yeshiva University's Benjamin Cordozo School of Law. Welcome, Representative Meng. Lastly, we have Dr. Aisha Yandoro, CEO of Springboard to Opportunities, a Jackson, Mississippi nonprofit that uses radically resident-driven approach to end generational poverty. In 2018, she created the Magnolia Mothers Trust, now the country's largest, longest running guaranteed income program, and the only one in the world to focus on Black women. In addition to leading Springboard's community work and growing the Magnolia Mothers Trust exponentially, Dr. Yandoro is focused on shifting gendered and racialized narratives around poverty and deservedness, and working to show how the success of the trust can be scaled nationally through policies like the expanded child tax credit and a federal guaranteed income. Her expertise on economic, racial, and gender issues is regularly featured in outlets including the Washington Post, MN Poor and Company, Essence Magazine, NBC Nightly News, and CNN. Dr. Yandoro is a TEDx speaker and a fellow of the W.K. Kellogg Foundation Community Leadership Network and Ascend at the Aspen Institute. She holds a BA from Tennessee State University and an MA and PhD from Michigan State University. So welcome to all of our panelists. So I'd like to start with a question for all of our panelists. So first, what would an equitable care infrastructure look like from your perspective? So I'll start with Rianne, if that's okay, and then we'll go through the other uh, panelists. Um, well, well, thanks so much, and it's a pleasure to be here today. Um, as I've spoken with Reshma in the past, um, one of the things that I see a lot through my customers, so our average customer is a woman in her late 50s who's typically three to five years away from retirement. Um, and one of the things that we see is that this consumer has taken time out of the workforce to care for children um, or to care for aging parents. And while many of them have understood what that decision meant for their near-term cash flow, mm -hmm. it's really rare that any of them understood what that actually meant for their retirement. Mm -hmm. um, and what we see, we see it through data. So my average female customer has saved $110,000 less than our average male customer for retirement. They have a 14% lower income. Um, um, they have a much higher propensity to plan to work part-time in retirement. Um, and they also have um, about a 20% lower social security benefit. Um, so one of the things that I've been really excited about this year was this introduction of the Social Security Caregiving Credit Act by mm -hmm. Representative Meng, because I think what that starts to do is help us understand not only the short-term financial implications that caregivers are, care caregivers are making, but I would, I would call it the unintended consequences on their retirement security. Um, and so when I think about financial wellness, I think a lot about how do we make sure that the consumer both understands the short and long-term implications of the decisions that they're making, but as a community, whether it's um, you know, tech entrepreneurs like myself or whether it's um, our representatives in Washington like Representative Meng, um, that we're really thinking about how we modernize you know, rules that were written you know, 80, 90 years ago uh, for the reality of what retirement looks like today. Um, and so again, unpaid caregiving, which is a concept we're all talking about, I do think we have to move the dialogue past just what the current financial issue is, but frankly, the 20 or 30 or 40 year issue that many Americans um, unwittingly are creating for themselves. Thank you so much. Uh, Dr. Yandoro. Yeah, no, thank you so much. And thank you all for having me. You know, I think when we really talk about a equitable infrastructure as it relates to child care or care, I think we have to broaden the conversation. I think what Rianne was saying about her population that she works with and really having conversations about those who are older, who have had to leave um, the workforce in order to care for kids need to be engaged in a conversation. And particularly when I think about my work and the folks that we serve, the Black women who are extremely low income have been telling us for years 
a, that our care infrastructure does not work for them as it relates to being able to work essential jobs where they're making less than minimum wage and still paying and still caring for their kids. And we haven't been having those conversations. We have totally left that population mm -hmm. out of the equation when talking about care. And it's just now within the last 18 months that we have been under the backdrop of this pandemic where we are broadening the conversation and we are really recognizing that, okay, care and considering it as infrastructure has not been supporting the needs of the majority of, of us because it became a middle class issue when there were middle class women and men having to do Zoom meetings with their kids in the lap. We finally start, and I am one of them, I'm going to be very clear. Um, we started having conversations about care and our infrastructure. And is it something that we have, is it a, um, a sector that we are supporting enough in order to ensure that individuals have what they need in a long arc to be successful. And the conversation is no. And so how do we really go about broadening the conversation and making it a conversation where everyone can lean into what is needed and lean into providing solutions, not just a few of us who happen to have the largest voices or largest platforms and are often given the microphone to have our voices be heard. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much. Uh, Representative Meng. First, I want to thank all of you uh, for including me in this really important conversation. And to my fellow panelists, I'm honored to be in your presence. And thank you so much for being the voices and the experts of, of folks who um, depend on a better and improved care industry. Um, if I could take a moment, Tim, I've always wanted to meet you because there was a point in time when my nine-year-old, I had signed him up for tutoring classes after school. And he, uh, unbeknownst to me, went on to care.com a testament to the success of your marketing uh, and tried to find an al alternate <laughs> method so he wouldn't have to do tutoring. I just, I've always wanted to share that if I had ever gotten to meet you. Um, but, you know, I think the doctor is correct. Um, you know, Reshma Sojani and I have probably been talking about this concept of a needed uh, Marshall Plan for moms and equitable care infrastructure improvements way before COVID started. Um, mm -hmm. But I think that our problems were really better understood and highlighted as we started going through this pandemic. Uh, working parents, working moms, particularly moms of color, have been pushed out of the workforce in droves during this pandemic uh, in order to meet the unprecedented demands of caregiving, both children, parents, and others in their oftentimes extended families, dealing with remote schooling and housework. Um, at the start of 2020, women made up the majority of the workforce for the first time in almost a decade, even though women suffered from gender and racial uh, wage gaps. But now, a year later, women have lost nearly uh, 5 million jobs and account for 55% of overall net job loss since the start of the pandemic. Uh, Asian American women, for example, account for the highest rates of long-term uh, unemployment. And that's why I work to introduce the Marshall Plan for Moms to provide a blueprint to ensure that working moms are prioritized in pandemic recovery plans that were not left out and protected against future economic calamities. There's no better time than now to seize that momentum to make much needed change. And the Marshall Plan calls for a robust paid leave. This is all common sense to all of you. Mm -hmm. Robust paid leave, saving our childcare industry, investing in universal childcare, early learning, and our K through 12 education system. It also calls for strengthening child poverty tools that would create transformational structural change that give moms, all moms, a fighting chance to recover from the pandemic. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much. Uh, Mr. Allen, so what would an equitable care infrastructure look like from your perspective? Thanks, Latoya, and thanks mm -hmm. to everyone on the panel as well. You know, it, what I what I appreciate and respect is this will take a diverse course of voices to really have this conversation sustain and be persistent in the, the, the future of what we're actually facing. And Representative Meng, if your son needs a tutor in the future, just have him hit me up and I will definitely help him out. So, uh, you know, <laughs> I really appreciate that he uses the platform. So 
But thank you to everyone who's also attending and watching. You know, you know, Aisha said it right, which is this is conversation has always been present in the backdrop. And COVID has really been, if there's one silver lining, accelerated the conversation to the forefront of what people are now talking about. CARES infrastructure is just common sense. It is something that America needs. It is something that has been woefully neglected for a number of years. And it is something that now people are paying attention to. You can't have a prosperous nation when half of your workforce is sitting on the sidelines because they're trying to figure out how to take care for their elders, care for their children, or care for anything in between. You have women leaving the workforce in droves, as Representative Meng had mentioned, and you can't get them back into an economy and have a thriving economy unless we figure out how we can support and put the infrastructure in place to have that be the future. Um, when I think about equity, what I really believe in is there's two points, many points, but two main points that I really focus on. One is accessibility. 51% of our children live in childcare deserts right now. They don't have accessible means to, to find quality, either in-center care or at-home care. And that's either due to economic reasons or that's also due to just availability. And the availability then goes into exactly what Aisha was saying, which is caregivers for a number of years have been underpaid and neglected. They haven't had a system that's actually supported them. And they've had a majority of silent labor hours, either through women who are working and actually taking care of the, the children, or even care, paid caregivers are getting marginalized with silent labor hours because it's expected that they will continue to take, they, they can't leave the child alone if the parent is running late or there's things happening or the expectations that are occurring. Accessibility is going to be key. The other piece for it is going to be affordability. And this is really where, if you take a look at the systems that are in place today from a government perspective, right? To only 20%, less than 20% actually, of children who are eligible for the largest federal grant for child care, which is the child, the child Care Development Fund, actually receive funding. At least 80% of children who aren't receiving the funding that they're eligible for. That really speaks to the gap of equity in terms of parents understanding how to access the care, how to navigate and receive the care, or even if you think about it, getting to the, to the, the, the nuances of it, they don't have the means to access even internet to go and qualify for the care and apply for the care. So you only get 20% of children receiving the federal funding that they actually are eligible for. And you have this 80% population sitting out there. That's only one example of where affordability and where we have to actually look at a multi-pronged approach between government, the parent, and I'd also say institutions and businesses. You really have to have this this coalition working and rowing in the same direction for us to be able to make childcare affordable across the spectrum through all of the programs that are available and really helping parents access those programs. Mm -hmm. So when I think about equity, I really do think in affordability and accessibility. And I think those are the two key pillars we need to orient ourselves on in order to make a difference. Great, great. So the, the next couple of questions I'm going to direct to particular panelists, but of course I'd love other panelists to jump in on the conversation. I mean, this is really just gonna build on the answers that you just gave for you to get a little bit more into the details. Um, so for uh, Representative Meng, if I can start with you. So what policies do you think must happen for the government to facilitate the vision that you've kind of put out for the Marshall Plan for Moms? Sure. Well, I just want to piggyback off what something Tim said um, was about broadband access, internet access. This was actually an issue that I had worked on way before the pandemic, and it was sometimes a struggle to explain to folks who either had internet or who were not in rural areas um, why this is important. And we all recognize its importance. And we've been working with Senator Markey from Massachusetts and um, Vice President Kamala Harris, who just announced on The View that every state is gonna get funding and we, were, we are gonna be able to fund internet access for 3 million more children after today. And so thanks for letting me mention that here, but I think it is very much related to working parents and to you know homeschool issues that we've all had to see so many people suffer through um, because we didn't have enough resources over the last year and a half, uh, especially. Um, but, you know, we're talking so much and we're hearing so much about the Build Back Better plan, infrastructure. We cannot build back better in this country if we don't include a better care infrastructure. Affordable and accessible childcare is the biggest challenge for parents who want to go to work and who want to have gained 
economic stability. Um, parents can't go back to work without childcare. We need to ensure that families have access and to affordable care. And that's why we've been fighting to pass the Build Back Better Act that invests about $450 billion to lower the cost of childcare and secure universal pre-K. This is so necessary for our families. We need to shore up and stabilize the care economy that was hit especially hard by this pandemic. Um, in New York, family caregivers who are disproportionately women provide an estimated 2.1 billion hours of care for older family members or loved ones with disabilities on top of their work and other responsibilities. And if we invest in this care economy, it would bolster wages for care workers, it would help parents return to the workforce, and would also create new jobs in our economy. And so I think that these, these, some of these are really central to helping working families regain their footing, especially after this pandemic, uh, and a true measure of what it will take to build back better in this country. Our other panelists, do you, given the populations that you work with, because I, I really heard that in the, the answers that you've given, do you have ideas too about what the government policies need to be in order to really focus on the populations that are um, important to you in this vision? Um, yeah, I can add some context to that. It, it really builds off what Tim was just saying, as well as Representative Grace was saying. I think that there's definitely a role for government as it relates to providing the infrastructure we need because government should be paying for this or it should be federal policy. But as it relates to that, we have got to stop the red tape that is in government with allowing individuals to access these resources. When Tim was talking about accessibility and affordability as it relates specifically to the child care payment program, I immediately started thinking about what's happening here in Mississippi right now with that program and the reality that about 90% of the population that is eligible are not receiving it and they're not receiving it because of redetermination guidelines that have been put in place by the state of Mississippi, which are blocking these funds to families and are blocking these funds to child care providers. And it's all because we have put this red tape of having families that ha actually have to go about doing child support enforcement, which has nothing to do with the federal policy since it's a block grant, it's a state policy. So every time I think about what's needed as the role of government, I always go back to narrative and changing the narrator, which is what I often say, and making sure that the families that are impacted the most, that their voices are actualized and heard the most when we are developing policies and solutions because even if there are resources there, even if we're saying, okay, let's make it affordable, let's make sure that we are getting the vouchers or doing the broadband and getting it to individual, getting it to the child care providers themselves. If we are having this red tape and creating these structures where families can act, cannot actually assess those resources, we still aren't addressing the infrastructure needs. So we still will have kids going without the care that they need. We still will have families not being able to re-enter their workforce. We still are creating conditions that are not equitable. So you know, I'd like to double oh, tap. Sorry. Please go ahead. Go ahead. No. Please. I was, gonna say, I was just going to double tap on the comment I made earlier about um, social security, um, particularly because Representative Meng has been on the forefront here. And I think, you know, this is an example of the need for modernization of government rules to recognize that we have these unpaid caregivers. They, you know, um, an individual could hire a paid caregiver, caregiver um, and that paid care caregiver would actually get social security credits. But the irony is that the unpaid family caregiver does not get social security credits. Um, a lot of this, though, if I zoom back out, also relates to Medicare. Um, so I would say that the financial services community in particular has let the consumer down by not helping them understand the financial cost of healthcare in retirement. Um, and while you know, we are about to enter Medicare enrollment season, um, we're gonna start seeing a lot of ads for free plans. Medicare is not free. The, the, the cons consumers will pay on average $500 a month if you start factoring in not only parts A and B, but you put a part D plan in and you factor in a supplemental plan but the average American consumer has not factored that into their retirement plan. And how this comes back to caregivers is that because the consumer is not educated enough about the cost of healthcare in retirement, they very quickly rely on family members to provide unpaid care. 
And so again, when I think about like financial literacy and education, um, you know, we get really excited about partnering with the government around how can we help the consumer understand earlier what the cost of healthcare is actually going to be over the arc of their life, because that at the root of it, it may not be the reason that um, a lot of moms are home taking care of young children, but it certainly is the reason that they're at home taking care of their parents. They're taking care of their parents because of the cost of health care being too expensive for the average American consumer to be able to, to, to pay. Mm -hmm. You know, I would love to piggyback actually on what you just said, Ms. Horgan, because one of the things is we're talking about the Marshall Plan for Moms, and I'm hoping you can talk a little bit more about really this is about a life course problem, right? What happens with moms when they're having young children is what's affecting them as they go forward in their life course. Could you talk a little bit more about that and maybe perhaps especially what you're doing with your company to really allow thinking about the life course rather than just thinking about moms with young children? Yeah, so for us, I mean, we're really focused on this consumer that's in their early 50s. Um, and what I think about is, and I know it's on the later part of that life course, but there's still time to course correct. And there's a lot of decision men and women are making in their 50s and 60s that actually impact their long-term retirement security. Um, so I think about that, just that big decision about when am I going to leave the workforce? Um, and there's definitely a conversation in Washington about potentially changing the Medicare enrollment age from 65 to 60. Um, but and the big the big kind of decision there for many consumers is again around this cost of health care. Um, so for us, what we think a lot about is how do we create an informed and educated consumer? Um, and while you can go on the web and you can do a lot of research yourself, what I will tell you is that Dr. Google is overwhelming the consumer. Um, and so we've actually built this product called Retirement School. And the idea behind Retirement School is basically Netflix meets retirement. How do we get you the content that you need for your personal journey? So if you're a woman in your 50s who's divorced and is thinking about retiring at 62, you're going to see a set of classes that are relevant to you. For example, social security for divorced individuals, early retirement health care for women, personalization. Um, and um, Tim knows this well, like one of, the, one of the beauties of technology is it allows us to deliver the personalized content or recommendations to the consumer so that we give them the information that they need at the right moment in time. Um, and so that's where I get really excited about the potential for public and private partnership, which is how do we use technology to get the consumer the information they need in a way that they're in a way that they're used to um, kind of consuming, you know, the internet these days. So you know, th this th you know this consumer is tech literate. So how do we how do we move past these kind of old websites or 400 page books that no one wants to read, and actually deliver them the information they need? at the moment in time that's most relevant. And that I think, um, you know, we focus on it from the age 50 plus, but I think if you, you know, do you dig deeper back into the twenties, it's all about how do we get this consumer that information about the choices they're making now, but also how it, what are the long-term consequences? So mm -hmm. this, I want the average 25 year old woman to know more about social security than it's a payroll tax in her paycheck every two weeks. Right. If she understands, that you know, she needs 35 years worth of earnings to get full credits and that if she gets divorced after nine years versus 10 years that she's gonna lose that benefit. Like mm -hmm. these are the things that she needs to know earlier. Mm -hmm. um, and that goes to this like literacy that's super important. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I'd love to jump in for just a second. I love what you're saying, Rihanna, which is it really is about the education and the literacy for the individual because a lot of times they come up to the doorstep and they're like, what do I do? Right, And the financial independence and the literacy of what they're actually going to be planning for at that stage of life is so important for them in order to map out how they get to retirement, how they can take care of themselves. And I also think it, it reverts back to, you know, I want to click back to what we we're talking about before, you know, on retirement and caregiving, it, it's also about the expansion of definition. Right. A lot of people who come to our site are looking for companion care for their for their their parents. And right now in Medicare, there's not a lot of funding that's available for people who need the touch points of companion care, such as, you know, did mom take a vitamin today? Can you go check in? Can you deliver a meal? Can you do the things? Because with over 80% of the aging population wanting to age in home, you need to start to have federal programs and funding that are going to support those companion care moments and also the moments that are going to be the in-between moments, not just the higher acuity moments. And I think that that's what, that's what Rand's speaking to and what's been there is, giving that financial education and literacy to the individual in order to make the decisions of what they're going to need at that stage of their life or how they can catch up and plan for that stage of life. I don't want to put words in your mouth, but I, that's what I'm taking away from this. 
but also the individuals who are younger, how they can plan ahead and make sure that they're able to get that. But we need the government to also step in and go, look, there's a larger spectrum of care when you enter the, the, the elder years versus it just being about these, you know, dementia, high acuity, in center, loss of facilities, you know, it's really starts to become how do we age gracefully as a nation? And I think that that's the conversation that's starting to happen, uh, you know, even with, you know, we, we focus on childcare a lot of times, but I'd also say in the senior care segment, that's a conversation that's really interesting and we're starting to see take hold as well. Um, there's one, one other point, if you don't mind, I just wanted to make, which is on the same vein, you know, it's, in society, we have this what I call reverse paradigm. We put the burden on young parents, either, you know, I'm part of the sandwich generation, but it's skewing older and it's skewing younger and younger as parents are getting older for the kids to start to take care of their parents and become those primary caregivers. Um, so you have a lot of families in their early 20s, late 20s, starting to have to take care of aging parents and also taking care of young children. And the reverse paradigm that, you know, we're watching and witnessing is, those early years are actually their least income years. Those are the formative years in a career. So we're putting a high financial burden on these young families in terms of finding child care, which is very expensive, right? On average, 13% of average household income, and also pay for how you're going to take care of your parent or make sure that your parent's there. And so it's causing this labor pool contraction a little bit, which is we're putting this burden on these younger workforce labor pool individuals versus us having systematic measures from a government perspective, from a business perspective, that allow for the earlier career formation to be less financially burdened and be able to actually take it on when you actually have formulated your, your income over the next, you know, as you get more experience, as you start to grow in your career, that's the inflection point. We should actually have the cost match the actual income that's occurring. So it's this weird paradigm we actually existed in American society that other nations have really started to figure out. You know, you have Germany who's really doing a, a big subsidy program in terms of elders and in terms of child care, uh, especially for the younger families. And you have Sweden, you have Norway, you have the rest of them. I think the United States is really starting to have that conversation. And we really need to focus on how we really prop younger families to be able to take care of their seniors and take care of their children and not have it be the financial hardship of the early formative years of their career. So I'm um, kind of thinking about that, uh, Tim, uh, you know, you have a company that's in the private sector and we were just talking about the public sector, what the government can do. What do you feel as though the role of the private sector is here in this vision of creating an infrastructure for equitable care? Yeah, I, I, it's a great question. So what we've started to see take foot is companies are coming to the table and saying, you know, they want to be employers of choice, right? Especially in the great resignation that's happening now with a lot of the workforce switching, having optionality, being able to change jobs. A lot of organizations are coming to the table and saying, how do we provide benefits that aren't just medical, dental, standard benefits that you would expect from an employer? How do we give benefits that actually make life work? And so if you look at what's occurred through COVID, right, with everyone working from home, I'm surprised my two six-year-old sons aren't bounding through here, running around, because, you know, that seems to be the sense of life now. I think the, the old, uh, I'll call it the old kind of uh, curtain that people used to exist behind of work and life as a separate entity, as separate entities, has been completely dissolved. It is now life. Right. And so you see people on Zooms, you see their families, you see their lifestyles, you see what's occurring here. And it's really removed that barrier of people going, oh, you know, you, you have kids, you, you've got a life, you've got to go do take care of these things. And you're not going to be here from a monolithic nine to five and sit there and just work. And so what I've started to see happening is corporations are going, oh, there's a new reality. There's a new normal here. And we're seeing it across the spectrum of jobs. A lot of times people will start, tend to think, oh, that's fine for white collar jobs. You know, you, go, you have corporate jobs. We're seeing it in retail. We're seeing it in warehouse working. We're seeing it in, in all kinds of facets of, you know, from fast food industry. They're coming to the table and saying, how do we provide benefits that actually support our employees to be able to work and be productive and have it all, so to speak. How do we provide childcare subsidies? How do we provide daycare subsidies? How do we provide senior care subsidies? Because we also know that a lot of our workforce is dealing with aging parents. How do we give them the guidance, the tools, to, to what Rana said, the education, the literacy of what needs to happen so they can make the most informed decision 
And we have a workforce that's then engendered to us and going, we're loyal to you. You've really stepped up at a time of need because most of the time when a, when a parent is looking for childcare, it is a stressful situation. They already have a full-time job. And so they're scrambling, they're trying to find a babysitter, they're trying to find a nanny, they're trying to find a daycare center. It becomes a large you know, uh, vestige of, of burden inside of their thinking process. So companies are now coming and saying, hey, care, how do we formulate a package that's specific to my workforce, that's individualized, not one size fits all, right? Because that those days of HR, I think, are over. You can't just take a healthcare plan and go, you're all going to get this, right? Because everyone has different needs. I have a special needs child, for example. And so it was a huge, luckily, I worked for the company, right? So like, luckily, I could pick up the phone and get the same services that um, our clients, our enterprise clients could get where they were able to guide me on how I can get assessments and what the next step is and where I need to actually turn to for resources from a government perspective. And that was a huge lifesaver for me. And they didn't, you know, I acted as a customer. So I don't think it's just because I'm a CEO that I got that treatment. All of our clients from a corporate perspective are now subscribing to that because their employees have such individualistic needs. And so long-winded answer of, I think companies have to step into the void. I think they are the agents of change in many ways. I think the government will do what the government does. And I think that that's forward for society, progress, bills, infrastructure, funding. I think companies have to also lock arms with them and say, we're going to also pick up a lot of the gap that may be present in society from a private, from a private sector perspective. So I completely agree with what Tim has just said. I um, I always I when we, we do a lot of user research. We talk to our customers to kind of understand you know what their journey looks like, and I can tell you that for this like late fifties consumer who's looking for part time work, the benefit that they're looking for is a good healthcare package. Um, and so this world of one size fits all for benefits um, leads you to like a. Um, a labor force that actually isn't diverse, that is maybe just one segment of from an age perspective or from a economic perspective. So I, I really do believe that this future, the future of benefits is in this almost like a la carte benefits package, that depending on who you are and what you need, there is a package that your company can put together to support you. Um, because again, if, if you're a company that wants a multi-generational workforce, the, the needs of the consumer is different um, at those different life moments. So I'd like to ask a question of Dr. Yandoro, because I, I kind of noticed within the conversation and also the panel earlier is that much of what we're talking about seems to really, um, I would say, affect what we consider middle class, white mothers and white families. And I know a lot of the work that you're doing is also anti-poverty policy. So how do you see kind of thinking about what an equitable care infrastructure looks like broadly within how we think about anti-poverty in general? Yeah, I don't think you can separate the two. And I think we keep trying to do that or we keep trying to act as if they're in these conversations that we're having in silos or we don't want to have the conversation about how a lot of racism and sexism are already baked into our care infrastructure or lack thereof of care infrastructure. And so, you know, when I think about how do we go about having an equitable care infrastructure, it really is how do we go about changing our conversations around deservedness and who is entitled to high quality care, who is entitled to having access to opportunities, who is entitled to having the safety to know that their kids are okay. In preparing for this panel, whenever I do a panel, I always you know, have conversations with the moms that we work with to say, okay, what should I be lifting up? What, what are we talking about here? And so this was no different. I went and I talked to our moms, okay, when we're talking about care, what is it that we're still missing? What aren't we seeing? And my moms talked about the accessibility, the affordability, actually just having the cash themselves where they could go about choosing their provider and not being beholden to a provider who would only accept the vouchers. You know, Tim, you talked about the sandwich population. A lot of my moms are sandwiched as well. They are caring for their moms or their fathers or other family members, as well as caring for their kids. And they don't have the benefit of having the early careers where their income can offset that. They are struggling with the reality of, okay, I am caring for my aging parent while I'm all 
also caring for my kids. I am still grappling with the fact that we are in a hybrid education situation. How am I supposed to work this job that is still paying me $7.25 an hour, which is our federal minimum wage here in Mississippi and our federal minimum wage federally. I'm grappling with that reality and we're not having the conversations about equity across all of those very basic needs still. And so when we think about this, or when I think about this, it's really, we still have got to get to the core of what we value. And we really still have got to get to the core of the conversation around deservingness. And, rea and the reality is everyone deserves care infrastructure that works for themselves and their families and provides high quality care options, not just a few of us. And we still, even though we're having conversations about broadening care, we still are having conversations that would only be beneficial to a very small subset of our country. Uh, Representative Meng, I'm, I wonder if you have any thoughts on that. I'm thinking from a government perspective, thinking from anti-poverty policies in general, how we can use the Marshall Plan for Moms to also address some of the issues that Dr. Yandoro is speaking about. Yeah, well, we really, government has to do a better job at strengthening child poverty tools uh, and combating child poverty, like the child tax credit Oh, you muted yourself. Um, expanding and making permanent the child tax credit. Um, we've heard so much from everyday working families about how the expansion this year has helped so many people and how they would love to see it made permanent. Expanding free school meals, which we've done here in New York City, uh, nationwide summer EBT program, uh, so many tools that government could relatively easily do uh, to combat uh, and address child poverty. Um, I have a bill that's kind of fun, but hopefully motivational. Uh, it's called the Honoring Family Friendly Workplaces Act, uh, which is uh, formulated um, after the EPAs, uh, there's an energy friendly program that would basically work through the Department of Labor to create and reward companies based on their family friendly work policies. Um, and so that's something that we just wanna highlight private allies who are doing the right thing by our working families. Um, and for my two cents, I, you know, for the private sector, um, asking employers uh, and, and public sector actually to be good listeners, flexible. You know, you've seen situations where a, a boss may try to um, reward their employees. And sometimes it includes like scheduling an event during pick up and drop off of a school's child, you know, a, a child's school day. And that just doesn't make sense. Ask your employers, employees, uh, what they want and what would help make their lives easier. And I agree with Rianne that we have to revamp uh, how government looks at childcare because um, the way that it exists uh, needs to be reformed as we see more uh, immigrant families, more diverse families, blended families, multi-generational families and caretakers. Um, we need to learn to be more flexible too. So one question that's come up in the uh, Q&A, um, and maybe this goes to um, uh, both uh, Ms. Horgan and also Mr. Allen, who are in this kind of tech world. How do you see your um, positioning as reaching people who don't have access to the internet, who aren't having access to broadband? Have you thought about how you can pivot into those spaces so that you're reaching a broader, um, I would say a broader population than those who have you know, easy access to the internet. Sure, I'm happy to jump in, uh, Arianne, if you want to go first. Uh, what I'd say is for us, it's something we think about all the time. It, it really gets the affordability and the accessibility piece of what I started out with. You know, um, it, it is about how can you disrupt access points so that there is a equitable field for people to, of all income bands, to be able to find care. Um, our mission is to really help families find care, period. And those are every family everywhere, regardless of income, regardless of means, regardless of accessibility. And so we focus on how can we get into the places where there is 
90% of federal funding not being able to be deployed, as Aisha had said earlier, and really help them and provide the means for them to access one, the funding, but then also provide the means of, of how do they access to find care that's affordable for them and have choice. You know, um, it, it's, it's uh, you know, Aisha said something that really struck me, which is, um, you know, look, moms don't need a savior. I am a dad who is privileged and allowed to sit here and talk about the things I see inside of my professional environment. But what moms need is recognition and they need allies and they need people to actually say, you're right, the deservedness conversation. It really does strike me there. And I think that that also goes into the segments of population too, right? I think lower income individuals need advocacy. They need allies to say, how do we get this funding to you? How do we give you access to means? How do we sit and make sure that you have choice in the matter versus only getting a provider that allows you to take a voucher? How do we really give you the, the mechanisms to really be successful regardless of the stage you're at in life? Um, and you know, really for me at the end of the day is it's about the kids, you know, it's about the children and of themselves. All the, you know, there's tons of research out there that shows when you invest in early childhood education, which is why I'm a big fan of universal pre-K, and you invest in early care, you provide the mechanisms of care. Should the, the kids grow up to have better incomes, better scores, better gender, better, better gender diversity, meaning that they actually recognize that when mom is out working, you know, little boys actually go, great, I'm, I have a better gender neutral view of how women should be working in the workforce. You know, it has all of these ramifications over life. And that starts with providing access and providing the means to do so. So I'd say, you know, it's something we constantly think about. It's something we constantly struggle with. As I said earlier, the red tape, um, you know, we really fight and, and advocate on the Hill for a lot of things that we, we want to see inclusive measures that don't just impact a 10% population, that impacts a 100% population. Um, and so, you know, we're constantly tooling and thinking and putting together programs to try to figure that out. It is an iterative process. I don't think anyone has the silver bullet. I think it's gonna take a village to do it, so to speak, which is why I love sitting on panels such as this, because you have advocacy and brilliance that is sit there and that is, ad, that is out there propagating this message. Um, but I do think it's gonna take time, but I do think it's something that we all need to focus on. It's something that we're focused on. So um, at Silver, you know, look, the reality is we are a tech company at our heart. And, um, you know, our point of view has always been that by using great technology, we can really empower the consumer. Um, but we totally understand that not every consumer has access to technology. So a, a couple things I would say, I think the first thing is that has obviously been this major change over the course of COVID. And some of that has been forced just in in like the world that I deal with, you know, most of my consumers used to go in person to a social security office. Um, and there are 60,000 employees who work at Social Security. The vast majority of them actually work in the field. Those offices are still closed. They've been closed since March of 2020. So a consumer today needs to go online or they need to get on a phone to actually get their um, questions answered um, for Social Security. Um, in the early days of COVID, we actually ran a hotline um, so that people could call in if, if they weren't comfortable using the internet, that they could call in and ask questions. Um, but when I think about how you scale that longer term, to me, it's all about partnerships. Um, and so I, as myself, like a mom of um, two young children, I'm always impressed by um, the quality of our local public libraries. Um, and that's where when you think about, again, education, how do you bring education to the community? A lot of that can be in partnership with local libraries. Um, it can also be in partnership with community and kind of grassroots organizations. In New York City, there's an organization called OATS, which is um, Older Americans and Technology, that not only gives consumers um, access to technology, but also helps them get comfortable with technology. Um, so to me, again, I think, you know, at our heart, we are a technology company. I, I understand that that means that if you don't have um, a phone, it makes it harder to access our service. But the hope is that through partnerships, we can get um, you know, our education and content out in, into the field and really impact more Americans as we do that. Mm -hmm. 
Thank you. So one of the questions that's come up in the chat and something that's very near and dear to me is the role of education in all of this, the role and not just education in general, but the role of schools. Um, schooling is the only compulsory thing that children enter. And as we talked about with COVID, with children out of schools, what that impact that it had on families. So what do you think is the role of schools um, within a vision for equitable um, equitable care infrastructure as a part of that infrastructure. Um, and I can start with anyone who has uh, any thoughts about that. I'm gonna take my um, legislator hat off for mm -hmm. a second and put my mom hat on. Mm -hmm. um, I think that this past year and a half, we've really seen some of our gaps and shortfalls um, of what we need to improve. I have really realized even more so the importance of after-school programs, for example. The day-to-day -day schedule of a student in our schools here in America don't really match the schedule of a typical working mom, um, much less an unconventional work schedule. And so even for me, and I have resources and support from my family members to help me with childcare, but even for me, having those after school programs and resources uh, just for a child to be in a safe space until a parent gets home from work has been a lifesaver. Um, I know we've talked a lot about internet access and this has become, uh, this is not a new issue, but it's really been highlighted because of the pandemic. Um, and, you know, the vice president just announced um, uh, over $1.2 billion that will be distributed. But as, as exciting that as that is and exciting as I will brag about it as a politician, there was about $5 billion worth of requests. So we're not even there yet to help all of our kids who need it and who, who asked for um, the help. And so I think also, you know, to better study what happened during the pandemic, like in New York City, we don't even really have a full um, accounting of which kids attended school and what they got out of the system over the last year and a half. And we really need to have a better sense of that um, before we can you know, go forward. So I'm gonna speak also as a mom. Um, so I have two young children. I have a seven-year-old and a nine-year-old and my seven-year-old daughter um, has some pretty significant learning disabilities. Um, and that when you go through COVID and you have a child with learning disabilities, you know, you, 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 first of all, I felt fortunate to be able to figure out how to put my own package of support together. Um, I think one of the things that's really interesting as you think about these children is the need for more flexibility in the system. Um, you know, I had long conversations with our school about um, giving my child the opportunity to repeat a grade. Um, and you'd be surprised at how challenging it was to, you know, to get, um, you know, ultimately they, they gave us the choice, um, but it was through persistence. It was through me recognizing that like English was my first language and I could like fight for my child. And I thought a lot about a number of the lower income Hispanic um, families in my community who I just don't feel like those parents would have been equipped to fight for their child the way I fought for my child. Um, and so I think we're in a world now where figuring out this like balance of like structure, but flexibility uh, to recognize that we do have like this ecosystem of children that have lost a year and a half. Um, we have to, you know, the, the old path may not be the path that gets them back on track. And we have to make sure this doesn't become a generational issue. Um, and so that's where, again, I think there's this like, and this is always hard, the minute you introduce flexibility, the question is making sure it's not being abused and whatnot, but I, I, would, I would personally err on the side of flexibility to give children the, the, the ability to get caught up. Um, and the moment is now to do it. You know, if we wait two or three years, we, we've created two or three more years of real challenges for students. Ditto to everything that's been said. There's research already that shows that from last year, under the um, arc of COVID, kids on average lost four months worth of learning. And I am sure that is much more significant in lower income communities um, because I've seen what that is, how that has manifested in the communities that we work in. And, you know, going to what something, something that Rand was just saying about, you know, how many individuals in her community would have had the bandwidth in order to advocate for their kids. I thought about that. I was like, but how, not only that, how many families would have had the time 
to go about advocating because you have to be able to have the flexibility of time to do that. But then also how many of them would have been heard? How many of them would not have been written off as being problematic or being too loud or being too abrasive or being too aggressive? And so we have to give families, all families, the same flexibility of advocating for what they feel are the best rights for their kids. And instead of getting back to this idea and this rush to go back to normal and feel back better, really why don't we tap into radical and imagination and build back different because what we were doing as it relates to education and care was not working. What we are doing now as it relates to education and care, it's still not working. And so what we will build in the future probably won't work either because even though we have pumped all of these resources into our, um, into our communities, we are not seeing those resources being deployed in innovative ways. We're seeing those resources be deployed for more testing and more testing coaches. And why do we need more tests? for kids who were just at home for a whole year. Um, can we go back about teaching some life skills? I was telling my 10 year old, I was like, you don't even know how to sew. You probably need to learn how to sew and build a fire and do some of those life skills because who knows what's about to happen with climate change. And so really let's tap into the ideals of doing something different and better for our kids um, and using all of this care infrastructure as a way to wrap that in as well. Thank you so much. Uh, I want to just quickly pivot to giving the uh, CLE code. Uh, sorry to kind of break the conversation in this way. Um, I think uh, Claire is going to share her screen. Um, so the CLE code is one, I'm sorry, not one, INF421. Um, again, it is INF421. Um, yeah, I said it twice. Thank you. And um, so we have about four minutes left. And, you know, I want to give each of you the opportunity, you know, if there's a question that I haven't asked, if there's something that, you know, you really think is important to say and get out during this conversation, um, I want to give you the opportunity to kind of do that right now. So what is something that you really think needs to be thought about within thinking about an equitable, not just the infrastructure, but for it to be equitable infrastructure um, that we haven't talked about yet? Um, and I'll, I'll take anyone who wants to kind of jump in. I'll jump in. What sure. I'd say is, you know, it's shocking to me that as a nation, we are still having debates about the primary basics of things such as paid leave for families. You know, and this is just a baseline fundamental that all developed nations have put into place other than the United States. And we are the greatest nation in the world. We are innovators. We are the, the, the future seekers. We are a prosperous nation. And we can't take a look at women who are giving birth to a child and say, you are guaranteed to have a job when you are done and you are guaranteed to come back and you should have leave to bond with that child and make sure that that child is taken care of. That is just, it's, um, it's like two minded to me. It's so, it's so it's like, I step out of my body when I hear these things. And I think as a nation, what we have to do both from a government perspective, but also from a private sector perspective is to say no more. We have to recognize the women in the workforce. We have to recognize what women are having to do from a silent paid labor hour perspective. We have to recognize from a, from a gender and a wage gap perspective. And we need to put the infrastructure in place in order to set that equity up as table stakes, not something that needs to be fought for or reached for. And I think that overall, what happens is the derivatives of that is you then have access to care. You then have sustainable wages for caregivers. You then have all of the derivatives that occur when you set the baseline of what's supposed to be expected as a nation and as a developed country in terms of what women should have access to from the overall perspective of you know, caregiving, from motherhood, from the contributions that they provide in society. Um, I would say that's one thing that I am the most excited about in this plan and in this bill is that it does uh, provide federal paid leave. It does provide uh, you know, maternity and paternity leave. And I think that that is such a, it's such a watermark that we should have already treaded across years ago, but it sets the stage now for us to really be able to have those conversations of materiality that will then produce exactly what needs to be produced for us to have equitable society overall. 
Thank gonna, you. Yeah. Maybe, I, maybe I could kind of riff a little bit off that, which mm -hmm. is just this definition of paid work. And in many ways, I think um, kind of we're kicking the consumer when they're already down, when we think about government benefits. Um, so social security payments are linked to the number of years you have paid work. Medicare eligibility linked to the number of years that you have paid work also linked to marital status. Um, and we're, whether we like it or not, we're in a world where a lot of consumers are getting divorced. And again, when social security was written, it was written in a world where there was a one income family, one earner, there was no concept of really of divorce happening. And I think, um, again, this world of, in many ways, it's kind of like a portability. Like how do we, how do we create benefits that accrue over time at a household level that can be shared at a household. And when the household formation changes, that both parties are treated equally. In a divorce, social security gives one spouse 100% benefits and the non-earning spouse gets a 50% benefit. That's wild. So when you think about like having a divorce where there's equity, like social security does not create equity in a divorce. Um, so again, I think we have to really go back to what's the definition of paid work? Um, how do we think about um, the nature of what families look like um, and make sure that benefits as a whole have really modernized those definitions um, so that the consumer really understands what they're getting long-term. I will say from a broader perspective uh, in the world of government and politics, and all of you are helping to do that, to normalize these conversations. These conversations, even as someone who um, is a daughter of immigrants, was born and raised here, is a mom myself right now, um, we really kept a lot of this under the wraps, right? Like even myself, I don't talk a lot, even with my colleagues. Um, so this is a lesson for myself too. You know, I don't talk a lot about the struggles of childcare, the struggles of helping to take care of our, our parents and our relatives. And so whether it's talking about it more with ourselves and acknowledging that there needs to be reform, not just while we're negotiating this bill, um, but during normal times as well. And, you know, I don't wanna get political here, but when you are talking to people who are candidates or your elected representatives to raise this issue, because it's not raised a lot. I know it's not raised a lot even to me and I'm a working parent. So I'm sure when you're talking to some of the other elected officials um, who might not be able to relate as much, um, it's probably not being talked about there either. So we really need to normalize these conversations, make sure they're kept at the table where decisions are, are being made um, and to kind of change that standard uh, of how we uh, talk about child uh, family care. Um, definitely think we need to normalize the conversations, but I also think that we need to make sure that those individuals who are most impacted by these decisions are actually engaged in the conversation. This has been a great panel, but I think the, just based on backgrounds, I think that most of us are taking this from our home, which shows that even though we have passion for the conversation and we are working in purpose, uh, this is not our lived experience of having significant trauma around care and care infrastructure. So really, how do we create space for those individuals individuals who are closest to the problems to be at the table and for those voices to be elevated and for them to actually carry their voice themselves, not always us carrying their voices for them because they have the ability to be their own allies and their own advocates. We just need to create space. Well, thank you all. This has been a fabulous uh, presentation. Um, and I really want to thank everyone for being here, for uh, Ms. Horgan, Representative Meng, Dr. Yandoral, and Mr. Allen. We really appreciate the perspectives that you were able to bring um, to this panel. So I'm going to turn this over to Madeline or Claire, I think. Thanks, Latoya. And thank you again so much to our panelists for such a thought provoking panel. Um, we will now have a 25 minute break or rather 21 minute break. Please return at 1.10 to hear pre-recorded remarks from US Senator Amy Klobuchar.